I want to just talk briefly on some some topic, a topic attribution that's been uh, on my mind a lot. Um, for those of you who know, I've been donating more of my time to uh, Homeland Security uh, in the U.S. And so I spend time, and I just recently spent a week wandering around D.C. listening to what everybody has to say and what's interesting. And the funny thing is the topic that comes up over and over is this concept of attribution, which is not a concept we have a whole lot in, in my hacker world. I mean, yes, you want to avoid attribution and not be caught. Um, but it's not something that a lot of people worry about. I think it's you defend your networks, you try not to get broken on, into, and then you move on with making money or your job. But to governments, um, they're really concerned about this concept of attribution because you can't have deterrence without attribution. And our whole sort of defensive posture is based on this concept of deterrence. Um, so you have all these people inventing all these kind of obtuse systems to try to automatically identify and attribute attacks, right? Well, we saw the packet come in from here, and then the packet came in from there, and then they, you know, the browser string was in this, you know, foreign language, and then they're probably from that country. It's like, okay, yeah, probably they are, but, you know, you're not going to launch missiles based on that information. This concept of evading identification is super old in the hacker games. I mean, how many people here remember chaining together so many systems until, like, your Telnet session was, like, ka-chunk, ka-chunk, like, four seconds, you know, it's like 300, 3,000 milliseconds of lag between each character on your SSH session. It's like, oh, I chained myself through one too many countries. I better back out. You know, it's a little too slow when your shell session is that slow. But thanks to the high-speed Internet nowadays, you can chain through ever more systems, right? You can bounce through five, six machines and probably not notice a whole lot. And you can do them between countries that hate each other and will never pick up the phone and talk to each other. And that gives you a lot of um, ability to hide. And so the limiting factor is almost a technology one. It's uh, network latency. Um, and because of this, um, technical attribution, at least in my perspective, is essentially impossible because clever adversaries know this. Now, of course, you can catch the low-hanging fruit and the dummies. But clever attribution, um, it's going to be very hard on a purely technical level, I believe, to attribute attack. And so just like in the spy versus spy world of the Cold War, right, you have false flags and misdirection. Um, you have people that plant evidence and implicate innocent people you're going to have the same problems with purely technical attribution. And so I'm, my, I'm saying that we have to learn to live in that world. You're going to have to live in a world where you can't hit a button and say, aha, I'm going to strike back to this IP address because it's clearly that country that's attacking me. And the State Department can't clearly look at these statistics and say, aha, Estonia, they're after us. It's like, no, it's probably not going to be that clear. So we need to develop systems to deal with that reality. And they're not going to be easy systems. They're going to be things like better treaties, you know, better working relationships with other um, uh, network security teams in different countries. Um, it's going to be a whole lot of traditional gumshoe detective work, right? It's like, well, we think we're being attacked from this country. Well, let's get some agents in there and spy on them. Okay, we think it's coming from the university. Okay, well, we should look at the university and watch what building it is coming from. Who's coming in and out of that building? Do the attacks stop when the lights go off? Do the attacks start when the lights come on? Then they're probably in that building. We're going to have to get better at connecting all the dots because a purely technical solution, I don't think, is the way that you can set, create policy uh, in the future. Um, but this also gives us a certain level of deniability, right? We are not 100% sure of who they are. Well, they can't be 100% sure of who we are. And that works both ways in law enforcement and the intelligence community because that allows us a certain amount of latitude to monkey around and try to get at them. It's not a one-way street, right? We can use this to our advantage right now. So uh, don't give up. Don't despair. It's not all one-sided. But you have to be aware of it and, and uh, take advantage. Okay, so that's kind of what all I want to say right now in attribution because we're actually going to hear something far cooler from Max Kelly. Um, so Max was in the FBI, and he was working in the uh, Max, uh, as in Macintosh and Unix forensics labs uh, at headquarters at FBI in Washington, D.C. But in 2005, he got struck with uh, uh, the bug and wanted to leave and do something more entrepreneurial and something more commercial. And he ended up uh, being wooed away and started the security team at Facebook in 2005. And he's built and run it ever since. 
And it's a really interesting challenge because you're constantly having to respond to every single changing threat that you can find on the Internet. And during that time, Facebook has grown, I don't know how many thousands of percent. And the people coming after you are like application scammers, spammers trying to get at your customer base, and all kinds of miscreants who stay up all night long trying to figure out ways to misuse the Facebook platform for whatever their ends are. Um, and so he's got to figure out how to do defense against these kinds of attacks, essentially in real time with uh, machine learning. And the other interesting thing is it's led to this philosophy, um, the sort of the Facebook development philosophy, is how do you do this in a high, rap in a high growth, you know, rapid development uh, uh, environment when the attacks are constantly escalating? And you're in the fastest development uh, environment or one of them in, in the world. So concepts, certain concepts that you've grown to, uh, to love, you, you can't do in that environment. And, and so that's led to this sort of unique philosophy Max has, has developed and will share with you, which I think is pretty cool. But before you get up, um, one of the cool things about knowing Max, though, is he works at Facebook, and you get to ask him questions about Facebook. And, um, and I recently started trying to use Facebook more, and I'm like, well, who are all these people friending me? How do you select who you friend? Like, is there a threshold? Do you guys have, like, some weird metric that you use? They have to know 10 of your buddies or whatever? And I'm like, how does this work? So I asked Max. I said, how do you, everybody in the world must want to be your friend? I mean, maybe, you know, you're not as, um, you know, you're not as cute as maybe, I don't know, the other Zuckerberg. She has, like, thousands of friends. But you have lots of friends. And Max has this philosophy, which is, I won't, friend anybody unless I physically met them twice. Because you meet a lot of people one time in your life, but you don't necessarily meet a lot of people twice, especially at conferences. And you have to actually remember them. And that seems like a pretty relevant threshold, right? I'm not looking for my next best friend. I'm just looking for people who are interested in the same things I am um, that are humans and not robots. So anyway, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Max, who's going to give you a really cool insight into life at Facebook and uh, I think a glimpse into the future of how you're going to have to develop and defend these high-volume uh, social sites. So, cool. Thanks, Max. Thanks. <laughs> Give you this one back. Uh, well, thanks, everyone, for coming out, and good morning, and I guess welcome to Barcelona if you're not from here, and if you are, um, thanks for coming. Uh, Interestingly, I think one of the you can you'll be able to tell during my presentation that Jeff and I didn't coordinate um, notes with his comments on what I'm about to say because, in a nutshell, I'm going to talk about how important it is to build attribution into your into your site and your security philosophy. <laughs> so keep that in mind uh, as we go forward. <clears throat> uh, when when they asked me to come speak here, I was thinking a lot about uh, what the right things to speak about were at Black Hat because it's very much focused on technical issues, how to, getting into the dirt, seeing the, the techniques and, and working on them. And I thought um, a lot of the ones that we use at Facebook are either very, very specific to Facebook and, and our environment or they're things that I don't necessarily want to tell people about because they're really important to how we, how we keep things safe. So I thought uh, what I can do is actually go up to the next step and say, for all these tools and techniques that, uh, that I'll hint about during this presentation, there is a unifying philosophy and, and way that we thought about approaching uh, security as we were building this company up at uh, rapid velocity that, uh, that will intuit to you, if you fill in the gaps, the types of things that we're doing. And I have some case studies, uh, some other cases that we worked on that I'll talk about that I'm not sure how much uh, uh, detail we've actually ever said in public before, so we probably learned something there. Um, <clears throat> so the, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is just directly kind of from the Facebook standpoint, where our values came from, what formed them early, early on in the, in the early life of the company, and what they are. Um, kind of our view of the world and how we view... Uh, attacks against us and how we deal with that. A little bit about spam um, uh, and uh, how we had some big anti-spam cases in the U.S. and I'll talk about how we created those and, and what they actually were. Uh, and then I'll, I'll revisit what I said because it's always important to say things twice, sometimes three, th three times. And um, I always like to have a small Q&A session uh, at the end because uh, if People always want to ask me questions, and, and, and I love to answer them. And actually, you can ask anything you want, um, Facebook or not. 